I also wanted to uh, begin uh, and open our panel by a long, long list of, uh, of thank yous. Um, first of all, uh, I wanted to, to thank uh, the American Study Center uh, for uh, allowing us or in, you know, having us uh, here uh, on this panel, and especially the gender sexuality research group that I'm a part of, um, uh, and the people who helped me in organizing this panel, and that is Karolina Krasuska, uh, Agnieszka Kotwasińska, Ludmiła Janion, and Natalia Pamuła, who helped me put this together. And obviously, I wanted to thank the panelists, who I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, this was very, very uh, short notice, and you've all agreed and been very patient with us. So thank you very much to Shani Betacharya from Lebanon Valley College, Joshua Davis from University of Baltimore, William Glass, Kristina Mazur, and Agnieszka Graf, uh, who will be moderating. Thank you so much for for doing this uh, um, today with us. Um, just so you know, I also wanted to thank uh, another person, Ms. Carolina Toka, who helped us with the design with spreading the word and social media. Uh, probably we wouldn't have this without her. Um, the idea for this panel is that we will first have our speakers discuss uh, various aspects of the current situation in the United States, and then we will open this for questions. So, uh, Agnieszka, I uh, give over to you. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you, thank you Marta, for initiating this and for surviving the, the technical crisis we've had. I would like to start by introducing uh, the speakers. Uh, those of you who are not speakers, please turn off your mics and your cameras um, so that people can see the panelists. Um, we are really grateful to have two uh, speakers from the United States from very different contexts, and I will start by introducing them. Shayani Bhattacharya um, is an uh, assistant professor of English at Lebanon Valley College, where she teaches world literature, post-1945 Anglophone fiction, post-colonial post literature and film. Her manuscript, Memory in Absentia, examines the way in which subaltern memories reshape the narrative form. Um, and her recent scholarship is focused on the ways in which speculative fiction allows for counter-hegemonic imaginations to reshape narrative form and recorded memory. And I hope we can talk a little bit about how what's going on in America right now um, uh, is in dialogue with both history and memory. And these are, of course, not the same things. Um, thank you for being with us, Shani. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Hi, hello. Joshua Davis is an assistant professor of the United, of United States history at University of Baltimore, focusing on social movements, policing, capitalism, and African American history. So you're really the perfect fit for this, um, for telling us what's going on in the States now. Your first book um, uh, is called From Head Shops to Whole Foods, The Rise and Fall of Activist er Entrepreneurs. And it explores how small businesses, such as feminist businesses and African-American bookstores, emerged from social movements and countercultures of the 1960s and 70s. And your current work um, is on police and the civil rights movement of the 1960s, a topic you have written for, um, uh, you've written about for the Atlantic and the nation. And so I hope you, you can bring in that knowledge into um, uh, our conversation about the police, but also about social movements. Thank you for being with us. Yep, thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. I'm, I'm impressed that this came together so quickly. I think it's excellent that uh, we're talking across the ocean and that so many people in Poland are really, really engaged in this issue. Mm -hmm. There you are. Um, uh, and our uh, two American Studies uh, Center speakers are Kristina Mazur, who is very well known to all our students, but not everyone here, I think, is our student, so I will um, introduce her as well. Kristina uh, received her MA from the English Department of the Warsaw University and her PhD from Cornell. Her major research interests are in American poetry, queer studies, and film studies. She's also written about transnational modernist and contemporary American literature, Latino, Latina, 
um, literature in the US and African American literature and film. Her poetry and repetition was published by Rutledge in 2005 and currently she's working on a book about queer feminist filmmakers, a collection of articles on queer experimental film. And may I add, um, Christina teaches uh, about African American uh, film history and literature at the American Studies Center. Um, thanks for uh, being in this panel, Christina. Well, thank you for having me and thank you, Marta. Uh, you really did an amazing job so quickly. So thanks. Thanks a lot. And thank you everybody for, for coming. Uh, we have 135 people with us. So it's great. Thanks. Okay, let's, let's not lose them. Thanks for being here. Um, uh, William Glass is our own American emigre to Poland. I'm always impressed by this fact. Um, uh, so he's a professor of American social history and American studies at the University of Warsaw. He teaches courses in African American history, film studies, the South, where he grew up. Um, and this will be relevant today. Um, uh, 1900 to 1950, and a co-editor, I'm sorry, uh, Film Studies the South and the History of American Religion. He's the author of Strangers in Zion, Fundamentalists in the South, um, in the first half of the 20th century, and co-editor of a volume of essays on nationalism called Beyond Imagined Uniqueness. Currently, he's researching a book on American evangelist Billy Graham and his tour of Poland in 1978. All right, um, and my name is Agnieszka Graf. Um, I'm not so important uh, here. Um, I do teach Amer African American studies, um, although it's not my main field um, of interest. I'm, my, my research is actually on the anti-gender movement, which I work on with um, uh, Elżbieta Korolczuk, who is also in the room. Um, and I'll be, uh, I'll be asking questions driven a little bit by my interest in the right. Um, as well as social movements in general. Um, we thought we would begin by introducing to you a document which was a few days in the making and um, uh, is going to go public today. And Marta will share uh, the text and I will read the text. It's not long, I promise. It's just uh, four paragraphs. It is a statement of um, uh, co-written by a number of uh, Americanists from uh, the American Studies Center and is being signed as we speak by uh, people uh, from other departments. Statement regarding the representation of Black Lives Matter protests in Polish media. We, the undersigned Americanists of the American Studies Center and others affiliated with the University of Warsaw, express our solidarity with the peaceful protesters in the US and around the world. Black Lives Matter. We fully support the ongoing struggle against racism and injustice in the United States, recently intensified by the death of George Floyd. It is clear that critical changes are needed within the US law enforcement so that African Americans will not lose their lives or be brutalized in incidents involving the police. But it is also clear that far more than police violence is at stake. Decades of systemic racism have, contribute, have contributed to enormous inequality in wealth, access to healthcare, education and housing, as well as job discrimination and voter suppression. Racial profiling makes African Americans much more likely to be imprisoned than whites. Many of these phenomena, uh, many of these phenomena are exacerbated by the perpetuation of harmful stereotypes in film, television, news media that create a false image of African Americans in the United States and the world. As scholars of American history and culture, we are deeply concerned about their representation and perception outside the United States. We appeal to media commentators in Poland to treat the ongoing protests with the respect and thoughtfulness they deserve and to educate the public about the racial and colonial history of the United States, but also of Europe. We strongly protest the sensationalism of some of the Polish coverage of the unfolding events. The protests have gone global. This is a historic moment that may hopefully lead to profound change, but this change cannot happen if public conversation about, about it is grounded in toxic stereotyping, factual inaccuracies, selectively used statistics, and ill will partisan argumentation. Journalistic integrity, but also common human decency, requires that even contentious issues and events be presented to the public in a balanced manner, relying on solid and nuanced understanding of the American history and culture. 
Regardless of our political views, we first of all see ourselves as educators committed to raising awareness of the complexity of the United States, including its racial legacies. To that end, in the following weeks, the American Studies Center University of Warsaw website will provide links to insightful articles and videos on the unfolding protests, as well as their historical and cultural contexts. So this is the statement, and today's event actually inaugurates um, that effort to educate, um, partly in response to questions by our students um, who um, feel that what is going on is connected to what they've learned, but the connection is not entirely clear to them. Um, they don't know how to understand it, how to think about it, and how to participate uh, in protests or how to not participate in protests in ways that will be uh, ethical and, I don't know, politically conscious, educated, and so on. So this, this event is meant uh, to, in, to bring a conversation about that will not just be about the states, but also about uh, what it means to us in Poland. Um, I would like to start with the first round um, that uh, would offer perspectives from each of you about this wave of protests. Um, and I'm hoping for a broad historical perspective because I keep hearing um, in the American media that this is the greatest um, civil unrest in the United States um, since 1968, since the death of Martin, since the killing of Martin Luther King. So what are the causes of this um, wave of protests beyond the killing of George Floyd? Is it just a massive act of, of, of mourning and grief? Um, uh, or is this a, a, a really comprehensive political protest that deals with more than just the killing of African Americans by the police? Um, how, would you, how would you inscribe this wave of protests into longer history of civil rights? Uh, and what do you think about the polit immediate political context of this um, eruption? Is this, to some extent, um, a wave of protests that has gone global because right-wing populism has gone global? Is this a wave of protests against Trump as well as against police brutality? Um, and what is the significance of uh, the COVID pandemic? I've been hearing um, sometimes not so generous assessments that this is just an explosion of impatience and unrest caused by the fact that people have been locked up in their homes and that people have been losing their jobs due to the epidemic and that race is merely um, a trigger and not uh, a reason behind them. So um, uh, starting with Christina, um, let's have a round of um, narratives that will allow us to think about uh, what's going on in some coherent manner to, to open up um, idea to open up the events to broader ideas. Uh, Krishu, please get us started. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so when I was thinking about this meeting of ours and and the opportunity to talk about what's going on in the in the U.S. right now, uh, I realized that uh, <clears throat> what we will be doing uh, will be necessarily a kind of remembrance and tribute as and um, a kind of a wake. Uh, and I'm quoting uh, um, a scholar of um, um, American society, Christina Sharp, who talks about African Americans uh, living in a continual wake, in the wake of slavery, in the wake of the slave ship, um, and a commemoration, as well as an attempt to understand uh, with all of you and with uh, our students uh, what is going on. And um, I, I was also, of course, thinking about uh, uh, how am I in a position to uh, discuss the topic, being a white uh, Polish uh, um, scholar. Um, and uh, so I will be using a lot of quotations today. I, I, uh, I masked up quotation to kind of quotations to prop myself up. And, and the first one that um, uh, I actually have talked about uh, with my students um, when we discussed Selma, uh, the film Selma uh, by Ava DuVernay, is, is a quotation uh, from Martin Luther King, uh, uh, a speech that uh, uh, he made um, after Jimmy Lee Jackson's death during one of the civil rights protests uh, called riots at the time. Uh, and Martin, Martin Luther King says, um, quote, we must be concerned not merely about who murdered him, but about the system, the way of life, the philosophy which produced the murder. Uh, which me as a student of, of, of literature reminds me uh, of, of Toni Morrison saying, 
that we must look not only at what the idea of race means for black people, but how it created white people, not only at what racism does to the victim, but what it does to the perpetrator. Uh, so I think that we need to kind of look both ways. Uh, but to go back to Martin Luther King, um, I think that the applicability of his words at Jimmy Lee Jackson's funeral um, and this um, horrific repeatability uh, of, of the death of, 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 of uh, Jimmy Lee Jackson uh, speak for themselves. Um, so I, I will begin by quoting. Who murdered Jimmy Lee Jackson? We know a state trooper acting under the orders of George Wallace pointed the gun and pulled the trigger. But how many other fingers were on that trigger? Who murdered Jimmy Lee Jackson? Every white lawman who abuses the law to terrorize. Every white politician who feeds on prejudice and hatred. Every white preacher who preaches the Bible and stays silent before his white congregation. <laughs> who murdered Jimmy Lee Jackson? Every Negro man and woman who stands by without joining this fight as their brothers and sisters are humiliated, brutalized, and ripped from this earth. When I heard President Kennedy had been shot and killed, and when I heard just yesterday that Malcolm X, who stood in this very church just three weeks ago, had been shot and killed, I turned to my wife, Coretta, and said the same thing I often say when one of our leaders is struck down. Our lives are not fully lived if we're not willing to die for those we love and for what we believe. Yes, yes. But today, Jimmy, we're doing the living and you've done the dying, dear brother. We will not let your sacrifice pass in vain, dear brother. We will not let it go. We will finish what you were after. We will get what you were denied. We will vote. We will put these men out of office. We will take their power. We will win what you were slaughtered for. We're going back to Washington. We're going to demand to see the president, and I'm going to tell him that Jimmy was murdered by an administration that spends millions of dollars every day to sacrifice life in the name of liberty in Vietnam, yet lacks the moral will and the moral courage to defend the lives of its own people here in America. We will not let it go. And if he does not act, we will act. We will act. We will do it for all of our lost ones. All of those like Jimmy Lee Jackson who have gone too soon, taken by hate. So, um, of course, what's happening is that, uh, that uh, after a quick analysis, King is uh, trying to um, rein in uh, or the, the pain or transform it into um, motivation for action. Uh, but at the same time, he repeats the name Jimmy Lee Jackson over and over. And I think that that repetition, this, this, this kind of uh, act of mourning is in itself absolutely crucial as we respond to um, uh, these crises. Uh, what, what King is saying basically is that racist violence is not a matter of individuals, um, but it is systematic, um, it is institutional, it is structural. Uh, it is not a matter of, I don't know, one white person disliking another, uh, but uh, that white supremacy is a structure that um, 
has been instituted for a reason. And um, that reason was to justify uh, the looting of black bodies. Um, the, the looting is the, the metaphor that um, um, the organizers of the meeting uh, have beautifully uh, used in 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 um, kind of introducing us to the to the problem of the of the responses to to the protests. Um, so what I'm saying, referring to Martin Luther King, is that um, both the killing and the protest um, are something that is happening over and over, and that has historical precedence and historical reason to be happening. Um, Tanahishi Coates uh, has said that, quote, America begins in black plunder and white democracy, two features that are not contradictory, but complementary. Africans enslaved were plundered of their bodies, plundered of their families, and plundered of their labor. Uh, this is the end of quote. Um, so uh, what we're looking at today, the present day uh, racial violence, was built on a long history of racially distributed resources and ideas that shape or continue to shape our view of ourselves and, and, and others within a society and the hierarchical system uh, that, that has been created as, as the effect of that. Now, the protest, as I said, is of course also historical. And um, uh, since many people have been talking about uh, the promise of the fact that it is a multi-racial protest, that there are actually quite a few white people that can be seen on the streets. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of um, a very, very important event of uh, 1976, namely the Bacon's Rebellion. And I'm saying this uh, to maybe some, some of the students are not American studies students, and it's worth talking about, which like today's protests were very promising because they were interracial. This was a rebellion of black and white indentured, indentured servants and some enslaved Africans who were uh, promised uh, freedom in return for participating in the, in the rebellion. And uh, the you know, a city has been burned, uh, uh, the planters in Virginia have been um, shattered uh, by the fact that something like this may happen, but particularly terrified of the idea that white mm. and black servants and slaves can get together and destroy the colonial capital. Uh, Michelle Alexander says that uh, the events in Jamestown were alarming to the planter elite who are deeply fearful of the multiracial alliance of the indentured servants and slaves. Word of Bacon's rebellion spread far and wide and several more uprisings of a similar type uh, followed. In an effort to protect their superior status and economic position, the planters shifted their strategy for maintaining uh, dominance. They abandoned their heavy reliance on indentured servants in favor of the importation of more black slaves and setting up uh, actually the, the opposition between whiteness and blackness, which has come into uh, uh, American English around the same time. Uh, so the invention of whiteness is actually, to a certain extent, a response, I think, to the danger that all of the poor and the oppressed will actually have a massive power mm -hmm. when they rebel. So the division and the split between the poor white people and, and, and black people is something that I think, uh, you know, the U.S. is suffering from until mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, William, I'm, um, well, I'm giving the floor to you. Um, okay, thank you. Just to add a footnote to Krisha's remark, um, remarks, um, one of the best books that deals with the issue that she was just discussing about this uh, combination of how slavery can rise along with democracy uh, is um, Edmund Morgan's American Freedom, American Slavery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a brilliant, brilliant book. And the last chapter in the book um, deals with how this happened in a historical manner. Mm -hmm. uh, and thank you, Krisha, for being a historian for uh, a few moments. <laughs> um, what I would like to sort of think about and mention is is some of the historical context. As um, Agnieszka mentioned at the beginning, uh, a lot of commentary has looked back to the late 1960s as as sort of the the only parallel to what we are seeing now. And I think that 
parallel is apt in some ways, that it, it's appropriate to look at that, but there are some fundamental differences between what was happening in the late 1960s and what we see happening today. Uh, in the late 1960s, you had not just African-American protesters, not just the civil rights protests, not just people walking across the Edmund Pettus Bridge uh, in Selma, uh, but you also had another stream of protest uh, going on, and that was the student protests against the Vietnam War. Additionally, as things fell apart in the late 1960s, uh, you had various groups flying off into revolutionary violence, like the Weather Underground uh, started um, uh, bombs. And, and actually, the, the protests and the violence of the late 1960s climaxes around uh, the early 1970s with the um, 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 National Guard firing on students at Kent State and uh, the, uh, the students that died, the African-American students that died in, at Jackson State. Um, I'm reminded of this because I remember this. Um, history by antidote is not the best way of, of telling history. Uh, it's not necessarily the most re reliable because it's memory, it's my memories of, of what happened then. And my memories actually go back to a, something a little earlier in the 1960s, uh, to a, a moment that seemed as violent, but also a, a moment that seemed to be more hopeful. Um, and, and I guess maybe that's what I'm hoping will happen out of what has happened. And, and that's the protests in 1963 uh, in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, I guess I was in junior high school at that time, but I also remember um, images that from those protests uh, broadcast over television, over live television uh, and, and in news reports. But the most searing image that I remember is from um, a photo essay in Life magazine. Life was a very popular magazine uh, of the um, 1950s and 60s. and it showed these dramatic images of the protests in Birmingham. And the one that stayed with me the most and the one that still is in my memory the most is of an African-American man sort of leaning back, pulling away from a uh, uh, German shepherd that is being restrained, sort of restrained by a Birmingham policeman. Uh, and something about that just did not seem right for me. And that contributed, I think, to changing the way I was looking at what was happening uh, in the United States in the 1960s. I, look, I, I don't want to overemphasize this. I, I didn't go protest. I didn't join the marches. I didn't do any of those things. But there was something about the fundamental injustice of what I was seeing there that parallels what happened to George Floyd. And that the way in which that video of a policeman leaning on the neck of George Floyd is changing the way people are thinking about um, uh, race in the United States today. And I think that that is what makes this moment also different from the late 1960s, um, that it is something that has sort of been seared into the minds, into the eyes of uh, a lot of different Americans uh, across all different races from all different stations in life, uh, and that that has created some movement that goes beyond just simply saying, oh yes, it's time to change. I want to be, and I am trying to be really hopeful that this does represent a moment where America will deal honestly with its past, some of which Krisha has just mentioned, and um, uh, come to terms with how um, the United States can move forward as a united states. Thanks, Agnieszka. Thank you very much. Um, 
the the image that I was reminded of, um, this is a haunting image that uh, people have argued against showing in public, is of course the Emmett Till, the, the mutilated face of Emmett Till. That was another um, powerful image that sparked off huge protests. And I think that uh, resonates very well with, with what Christina was saying, the, the, the urge to commemorate, the urge to say their name. Which is very, um, which is a very important part of the protests in Poland as well. And I, I was there, and I saw. Maybe we'll, we'll be able to show some images later. There, there were Polish kids with um, uh, posters of individual uh, African Americans who had been killed by the police. So, I think the the um, uh, the idea is that we that that this is not an abstract cause. This is a situation in which people all over the world empathize with the mourning of um, you know the the loved ones of people who were killed. That these are real faces. So um, you know you, if you look at images from all over the world, uh, one of the uh, one of the most uh, important signs, besides obviously uh, Black Lives Matter, is I can't breathe. Uh, the 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 words. Um, um, uh, of George Floyd, and also say his name, which is part of the the, the endless um, rep re repetition of commemoration. Um, so yes, this this happens repeatedly. The question is whether this time it's somehow also different. And you've been suggesting that part of the difference is that these are no longer protests of black people against racism. These are uh, protests of both black and white and other. Uh, uh, other ethnic and, and uh, racialized groups against race as a construct, as a way of um, categorizing people. So, um, uh, yes, all of this, um, uh, all of this certainly is on our minds. But there is also the um, the very concrete aspect of police brutality, and um, hopefully we can we can talk about this as well of, of how how it works, how it's possible, and whether it's that much difference in the States uh, from, uh, from the way it operates in, in Europe. Our next speaker is Shayani. Um, I, I give the floor over to you, please. What's your take on what's going on? And where are you? Could you tell us a little bit about your immediate context? Sure. Uh, thanks, Agnieszka. I, um, so I want to echo what the other panelists have said, that this, I think, is an incredible endeavor and to have put it together so quickly and all of you organized it and clearly the sheer volume of people that I see, more than 150 participants, it's I think fantastic and it speaks to how this moment is different, not just from the 60, uh, 67, 68, but also from um, 2014, oh, uh, Ferguson, like Ferguson burnt, the rest of the country watched, the rest of the world watched, but I think in this moment, the fact that there are protests across the world in Warsaw, in Berlin, in um, Paris, in, um, well, uh, in, in uh, Cape Town is, is really important. And I think um, the question of why this resonates in this moment is it, uh, one of us brought up this question of uh, how does it de this pandemic within a pandemic, where we are looking at the pandemic of racial injustice oppression and violence towards predominantly bodies of color, especially black bodies, is not a new phenomenon in this country. It is not news, it is not surprising, it should be, that people who are sworn to serve and protect often end up um, taking the lives of people, of the communities they're supposed to serve and protect. And um, I don't know if uh, you've been talking about um, certain organizations like Campaign Zero that have really good data back resources that talk about the sheer um, alarming statistics of the number of people who lose their lives to police brutality. But I think this is the point where the pot bubbles over finally. And um, it's disturbing, it's angering. Um, and I uh, live in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is a, um, uh, it's a pretty small town in sort of central Pennsylvania, so it's a um, semi, it has pockets of liberal progressive politics, but it's predominantly surrounded by more right-wing Republican politics. And um, it's a really um, unfamiliar sort of urban space for me to inhabit because I grew up in India and in um, multicultural cities, and then I did my... Um, uh, PhD work in 
Buffalo, which is in Western New York, uh, also recently in the news for the policeman who shoved and pushed down an elderly gentleman. So, you know, Buffalo is no, um, uh, is no stranger to racial inequality and police brutality. So I think the about a decade that I've lived in this country, it's been a standing witness to this moment. And um, it sort of, when we think of watching a video of someone being murdered by someone else, and um, to think about that idea that, okay, you know, before this, before we all had cell phone cameras, where the idea of the surveillance state has now turned on its head, where the people being surveilled can also surveil those who are in power, you think that is the moment where we can say, okay, all right, you know, now in front of a jury of one's peers, in front of fellow citizens, we can get an indictment. You know, um, but we've noticed, like take for instance, Philando Castile's case, um, we noticed that a jury of peers, despite looking at the video taken by his partner of the police officer shooting him at no provocation, the murder of Philando Castile, the, the jury still doesn't indict the police officer. So then you have to ask the question that what is the purpose of this? video evidence, right? And um, I think, in, uh, Agnieszka, you brought up Emmett Till, and I think it's so important because so many um, civil rights scholars say that is the turning point in the civil rights movement. Um, the publicity, the, the visualization of the horror of the body of Emmett Till made shockwaves across the nation and across the world. And we see this repeated ad nauseum since 2014. But it doesn't seem to, I don't want to say it doesn't seem to make a difference because on one hand you see the likes of Philander Castile's case and you think, well, what's the point? Because what, what you do see is um, the fact that uh, a video of a murder gets retweeted often to black people's feeds and the voyeuristic nature of sharing black people being murdered. Um, racism doesn't end with sharing these videos, right? Um, it doesn't end because we see the way in which human bodies are looted. But uh, it's important to think about uh, what we do with these videos and what we can try to say through them uh, because it is a perpetuation of trauma. And I've been sort of struggling with this idea of why we need to perpetuate trauma, to legitimize the suffering, the violence, the oppression, because to be honest, like it's it's terrible and it's not a comparison, but when um, we see terrorist organizations beheading white bodies, they get immediately taken down, as they should. We, we take down videos of animal brutality, but we consume brutality against black bodies because apparently if we don't, there is no legitimacy to this. So I think it's really important we talk about the importance of video evidence, but I think we need to pause and think about why we need this in 2020 to still convince people that black bodies are basically often cannon fodder for the police and that we need to show the violation of black bodies to convince people that black lives matter. Um, I uh, listened to um, DeRay McKesson, who's a, an author and an activist. He has a fantastic podcast called Pod Save the People, where he talks a lot about how um, there is hope in the way in which this movement is spiraling. There is hope in the number of people who are talking about it. And hope is not magic. You know, we often think about hope often aligned with faith, but I don't think hope and faith are the same. Uh, hope is the possibility of change, and I think it's possible to do that through more work. So, you know, instead of talking about the way in which the police um, attack and, and brutalize and kill threatening back black bodies, we can also think about the moments when, for instance, white mass shooters get talked down, where mm -hmm. the, it's not that the police don't have that in their toolbox. The question is, why does it not apply to black bodies? Mm -hmm.
Thank you very much, Annie. I'm really grateful for for this nuanced approach to what these images mean, to how incredibly effective they can be in getting people to empathize and be active, but also that there is an ethical question around endless circulation of images of mutilated bodies. And there's a long history of this debate, of course, both in the context of African-American suffering in the United States. And um, I think many of us at the American Studies Center um, uh, taught and discussed with students the controversies around the exhibition without sanctuary, um, which, which happened to, in, the, in the late 90s, if I remember correctly, which was a collection of sh shocking photographs um, from, from lynchings, which had uh, a second life of circulation, first uh, as racist images and then as anti-racist images. But the question is, do we really have the right to consume these images of suffering bodies what what does that mean to us um, uh, so so thanks thank you very much for that and also for the reminder that when Ferguson burned the rest of the world watched so what is what is it that that changed now and is it is it COVID is it Trump what is it really um, Joshua it's it's over to you um, also to bring us uh, back to the ground to provide some factual information about how the police works in America and what is this business with militarization I think a lot of Polish um, audiences are, are confused about the different kinds of police and 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 the sheer brutality I don't think we maybe I'm naive but I don't think we see that on such a scale in, in Europe um, Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Anjaniska, and, and thank you, Marta. Thank you both for organizing this. I just want to say it's it's really uh, wonderful to see this show of solidarity, 150 people getting together, uh, scholars and lots of students. And uh, I'm uh, speaking to you from Baltimore, which is honestly not that far from Shayani geographically, an hour and 20 minutes. Um, but maybe uh, socially is fairly different from uh, Lancaster. I'm sure some of you remember uh, the killing of Freddie Gray in 2015 and Baltimore uh, uh, erupted in a rebellion that went on for a week. Um, here in Baltimore, it's been relatively peaceful, but there have been 10 consecutive days of protests um, and it's it's been tremendous. So. I wanted to say a few things, you know, obviously there's a few different things that came together. It's the brutal killing of George Floyd. It's also the killing of Ahmaud Arbery, who some of you may have heard earlier in May. It's the killing of Breonna Taylor. Um, those are just three individuals. Uh, American police kill more than 1,000 uh, citizens per year, over 1,000. And the statistics, I'm not minimizing this, but in 2019, 48 police officers were shot and killed uh, as a result of crimes um, versus a thousand citizens. Okay, now um, I think it is important to bring up the context of COVID, not just because people have been inside the houses because people are ready to finally get out and protest, but I think um, one thing that our president has shown is a tremendous indifference and disregard for black life in terms of coronavirus. Coronavirus, over 100,000 Americans have died, uh, more than in World War I. And they are disproportionately black Americans. The statistics are really, really scary. And the president has not even really expressed any grief, any sadness. There's been nothing for it. And all it is about whether he's winning the political battle. And people have been watching. So I think they feel this in their bones that his, he holds black lives in very little regard, whether it's coronavirus, whether it's police killings. Um, I think one bit of context, I'll compare it at the moment right now to um, when Eric Garner was killed in 2014, which I believe uh, someone referenced. Uh, we did have protests across the country. There were a number of days where there were protests. I was in North Carolina, I went to a protest there, and these are big protests. Um, that, those were the original I Can't Breathe protests. But those protests were still significantly smaller and significantly fewer than today, and in significantly fewer cities than today. It almost goes without saying, but uh, the president's absolute hostility towards any protesters questioning police violence and questioning the killing of black people, it's not even just indifference, but you know, we'll get to this in the next round of questions, but 
his hostility to protesters is so palpable. And people can debate what President Obama did to stop police killings. But one thing he did do is he expressed sympathy, empathy, grief, and he tried to de-escalate the country when these protests were happening. Okay. Um, you know, there's another kind of thread here where Trump has again and again unapologetically endorsed police violence. This is not the first time. It sometimes it's little jokes, like he made jokes about police officers putting suspects into police cars and knocking their heads on the door frame. He made jokes that even some police organizations have said, we don't approve of that. And yet there are a number of police organizations, for example, the Fraternal Order of Police, it's a police labor union, the police labor unions are much, much more conservative than traditional labor unions. The Fraternal Order of the Police, the National Police Group, for example, endorsed President Trump and his uh, candidacy in 2016. That gives you a sense of where they are politically. Um, I want to just add a final thing about the militarization of the police, which has been going on for decades. The history of policing and mass incarceration is complicated because for some people it's very easy to say, this is just a continuation of slavery. This is just a continuation of lynching. There are certainly threads there, but what a lot of scholars have found, which I think is even more disturbing, is that the 1970s, the 1980s, the 1990s saw a tremendous intensification of imprisoning an intensification of police officers having bigger guns, deadlier weapons, the rhetorical campaign of the war on crime and the war on drugs. We can see statistically that the proportion of Americans from the 1970s onward who are in prison has skyrocketed. There's a much higher rate of people in prison in 2020 than there were in 1920 in the United States. And there's something scary about that. Um, and there's a growing number of scholars Michelle Alexander. Uh, there's a sociologist at Johns Hopkins named Zesla Weaver. She talks about front lash. You could call it backlash, but it's the idea that many of these bad developments, the growing militarization of police, mass incarceration, that at least are partly motivated as a pushback against the gains of black Americans in the 1960s and 70s. There's something very disturbing about that, and there's something that we as a country have to face that we have actually made these things worse in the last 50 years. I'm gonna just stop right there just for the sake of time, but if we wanna talk more about militarization, that's also fine. Thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, really happy that you mentioned Michelle Alexander. Um, her book, uh, The New Jim Crow, is actually taught in many courses at the American Studies Center and uh, referenced by our students. And the argument of continuity uh, from, from slavery, segregation to the mass incarceration, as well as arguments about what the so-called war against drugs really meant in terms of um, uh, mass incarceration. I, I think a lot of our, our students are aware of these arguments. Um, I, I, I think this is actually a great bridge to our next round. Um, I wanted us to, to do the what good cultural uh, studies people do, which is focus on a very particular theme or word. We focused quite a bit on images. Um, our theme now will be the word looting, um, which uh, has crossed through Polish media, um, although probably without the resonance that it has in the United States. Um, it's also part of the title of this event. So let's explain what we mean. Uh, the, the, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is uh, the quote from Trump's Twitter, um, the document of our era. When the looting starts, the shooting starts. These words were used by Trump on May 29th um, uh, in response to renewed police um, use of force against uh, protesters. This time they were not so peaceful protesters. Um, and it was later followed by him claiming that he did not know what it meant, what it implied, and who he was quoting. But very quickly, um, 
American media explained to the public that he was um, perhaps unwittingly uh, quoting um, the Miami police chief uh, from 1967, who had said, there's only one way to handle looters and arsonists during a riot, and that is to shoot them on sight. I've let the word uh, filter down. When the looting starts, the shooting starts, um, said, the, uh, said Hadley, referring, referring, of course, to civil rights. Um, the, the the word was also picked up um uh, so so the word looting becomes a signal for justification of police violence um uh, to defend uh, the sacred right of property but the word is also taken up um by um progressives or people who are protesting and expressing their solidarity with protesters, perhaps most memorably um, in a video that went viral um, when uh, the Daily Show uh, host Trevor Noah talked about systematic racism in the United States. And when speaking about the riots, um, he pointed to the reality of our society as being the culprit and epitome of the frustration. The real looting, he said, is the looting of black bodies. Um, so. I, I, I realize that this, this really um, is quite an emotional uh, linguistic moment for me when I got involved in a very heated debate on Polish um, uh, uh, Facebook where someone used the word tłuszcza, um, which, is, which is a really um, nasty word for mob. It's a word that expresses fear, but also disgust. And and I reacted with a frenzy. I, I try not to go frenetic on Facebook. I know that can lead to bad things. But I think social media have this way of spiraling around words that make people really emotional. So my request to you um, is now to comment on the word looting, what it means in, in for, for different sides of this debate, what it means for African Americans, what it means for the debate about uh, human rights, um, race, property, um, and the social contract uh, in the United States. Um, and I would like to, uh, Shayani, to start this time. Sure, thanks. Um, and I think uh, it's sort of really important to think about this, um, the way in which the media has been representing, at, or sometimes falsely, representing um, the protests in, it, it raises a false equivalency between property damage and the loss of lives. Because, you know, if, if, I, if a target burns or a Macy's is looted, insurance covers it. But insurance doesn't reinstate the lives of the people lost. Um, or the fact that when we see these horrific videos of police driving cars into protesters, of um, directly in, of, of um, violently attacking peaceful protesters. And it also raises the question of, therefore, is only peaceful protest legitimate protest? The whole point of protest is that you are protesting against a status quo that does not treat you equally. So no protest is going to be considered legitimate by the state. I mean, uh, let's look at the Vice President Mike Pence, who said that, you know, um, we encourage and we, we support peaceful protests. But when he was at a football game and the uh, players kneeled during the national anthem, he walked out. That's a peaceful protest. Uh, we've talked about uh, Dr. King several times in today's panel, who encouraged and, and was an advocate for nonviolent protests, but was assassinated, um, was um, vilified during his lifetime. Um, so I think uh, when we draw a, a, a distinction between protests and, and, and legitimize only peaceful protests, it sort of, um, I think it sort of obfuscates the, the problem because when we say looting, we, we're talking about a differential in power, right? Um, the people who are called on to be nonviolent have the least amount of guns or the, or the least amount of damage where we see police in riot gear, heavily militarized police that um, Josh was talking about earlier, um, taking to the streets with rubber bullets, with tear gas, with, uh, um, you know, like, uh, with like SWAT team equipment. So um, I think this is the right idea of black Americans having their principles delegitimized, right? I mean, you brought up Trevor Noah's um, video, and I think in that he talks about how, um, for the have-nots, there is never any right way to protest, right? Kneeling, marching, none of it is ever right. So what you do see is you watch your lives being looted day in and day out, or you watch 
um, the way in which home loans get restructured in America and um, the looting of black homes in that way when they lose their homes because of the way these loans are structured by Wall Street. Um, it happens to people because of the color of their skin, right? It is happening to you because of your skin color. Um, in moments like that, when uh, I, I think we have to think about why there's an attack on the constitutional right to assemble, isn't this um, free speech as well? And instead of thinking about uh, protesting as a, as a dichotomy between looting versus you know le legitimate protesting, think about what we say to the people who who cause this trauma. Right, like defunding the police, that becomes an important conversation that one has. It doesn't mean we do away with what this country still seems to really um, put on a pedestal law and order, but why do we expect the police to do the work of mental health workers or psychologists or um, community organizers, right? Uh, why, in the case of a, a dispute among two homeless men, do people call the police? Why isn't there funding for um, community work? Why isn't there funding for social services? Um, if we think about Minneapolis, it, it, uh, according to a Washington Post article, in 2019, the Minneapolis police only cleared 56% of their homicides and 22% of their rape cases. So it's not like they're serving their community effectively. If, if we think about it, if 5% of arrests are for violent crimes, does it make sense to have 100% of the responders be heavily on police? So I think this obfuscates that conversation when we think about protesting and, and uh, equate that with looting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Josh, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think, you know, whether the president whether President Trump knew where that quote was coming from or not is, you know, it's it's really just the sentiment there. But I think it probably was unwitting because most things he he does is unwitting, at least a lot of them. But I think his instincts are what matter, and his instincts are to um, express violence um, in response to what he sees as an affront to authority, and. I think what's really important here is that so much of what the police are doing right now, I'm not saying all, but many police, I mean, I, I just, you know, I, I, there's been so many clips I saw, there have been police attacks during protests on protesters in probably more than 50 cities in the United States that have been recorded on video. Those are just the ones that are recorded on video. Um, and I think those are very important for people to see how much law enforcement officers reject anyone who questions their authority. But I want to emphasize that there's many different types of violence that law enforcement have long used against different protesters. I think this is where the specific context of the civil rights movement is very, very important. I wrote an article uh, for The Nation last December, and it was called w William Barr's Police-Fueled War on Civil Rights. And it was about how the Attorney General of the United States, working with Trump, has really just borrowed the rhetoric that was used against the civil rights movement by law enforcement, and now applies that to people who criticize the police today. And you know, one of the most insidious forms of violence, not just physical, but police unions, the president, the Attorney General, and a large array of conservative forces over the last five years have done their best to totally delegitimize the movement for black lives, to brand it as terroristic, as mm -hmm. black identity extremists, as the FBI uh, coined a term. And this is exactly what law enforcement did in the civil rights movement. Not, not just people like the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover, but on the police level, the city level and the state level, a constant discourse saying that black activists in the 60s um, were lawbreakers, that they were communists, that they were dangerous radicals, that they had plots to foment riots. And again and again, we're seeing that same linguistic, that same rhetorical mm -hmm. textbook today. Mm -hmm. It's going to continue in the weeks and months ahead after these protests die down. Um, you know, 
massive amounts of surveillance of protesters, which again, local police did that all throughout the 60s against mm -hmm. the civil rights movement. Everyone all the way up to Martin Luther King. And again, it's not just the FBI like we saw in the movie Selma. It's on the local level. And it's not just the places you would think. It's the most so-called liberal cities. It's New York, Los Angeles. Um, so I think, you know, it's important that we keep a broad perspective, the different forms of violence that elected officials and law enforcement officials use to respond to what they see as quote unquote looting, because it's a very widespread campaign to try to discredit these protests. And I think the level of intensity and animosity that we're seeing, the pepper spraying in the face, the pushing a 65 year old, 75 year old man down, a lot of that is fueled by the outrage that police officers have. How dare people question the job we do? How dare people who don't know what we go through say that we're doing things wrong? Thank you very much. There, there are all these images, and they are quite shocking. I was, um, I watched a sequence of videos of uh, police being violent against journalists, also, um, which is sort of the, the the one thing that is just not done in civilized contexts. Um, but there are also images of the police kneeling in front of protesters, of policemen hugging protesters. So I think uh, America is really going through a, a, a serious soul searching about the role of the police, um, what it means to be. In authority, um, uh, what it means to be the, the, the go-to place when someone is in trouble versus the, the, the person you're scared of when, when, when trouble begins. Um, uh, Will, your take on looting, please. It's interesting. The, the Looting is a question of law and order. And of course, Trump proclaimed himself the president of law and order. And again, that goes back to the late 1960s when uh, Richard Nixon was also making this uh, covert appeal to racist sentiment through using the term law and order. I uh, really appreciate what um, Shayani had to say about the idea of the surveillers being surveilled themselves. I mean, that is so significant and so different from what was happening in the late 1960s. Yes, you had journalists there. Yes, you had news cameramen taking pictures and, and broadcasting that. But it's something different that we are seeing now uh, uh, in this regard. And there, there's a, a, to sort of go in a little bit different direction, um, Ta-Nehisi Coates and Ezra Klein had a, um, a podcast recently that um, uh, really makes an, some interesting points about the idea of protesters are supposed to be nonviolent. Well, what if we turned that around, they ask and discuss. What if we turned it around and said, what if the police acted nonviolently? That that would radically alter the whole dynamics of the situation. If you're coming in in riot gear, if you're coming in with these big, huge tanks, it automatically escalates the situation. Uh, you know, I if, if a and and they 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 were also making points about how police are seen differently in black and white neighborhoods you don't in in the us you don't see police going through white neighborhoods in quite the same way that you see uh police walking through black neighborhoods you african americans don't call the police uh when there there is trouble they they see the police as a last resort which is is unfortunate because sometimes they do need to step in but as was being said earlier they aren't social workers they aren't the ones who uh have the training to talk someone who is bipolar down from a manic situation uh, those kinds of incidents should be dealt with by uh, um, uh an auxiliary to the police force uh that that is one of the ways one of the things that probably should be done uh, in light of what's happening. And this, this discussion about uh, the Minneapolis uh, police uh, city council talking about uh, dismantling and uh, rebuilding the police force, uh, that is something that should seriously be considered in, in other places, really defining what we mean by public safety and how we go about 
achieving that, uh, I think is one of the um, central issues that is up for discussion that comes out of this, um, uh, out of this crisis. Agnieszka? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, as I listen to you speak about white neighborhoods versus black neighborhoods, um, I'd just like to point out that it's also about uh, your bodily integrity. White kids who go to various kinds of political protests are not used to being uh, brutalized by the police. Um, this time around, they, they are experiencing that kind of trauma. And um, I think it was David Ost who commented in uh, the Gazeta Wyborcza interview, a po political scientist, um, that this may be a, a turning point that uh, that this it's not just about white solidarity with black struggle but it's also about white people's experience of the brutality of the police that there that this is a different um alignment of you know who is scared of whom um thank you very much for those those comments uh Krisha, i think you have some uh, uh cultural sources to reveal to us of the word looting well yeah i, I can say that obviously that the, the the word looting was actually invented by uh, the British in the colonial context um, as they were looting Africa and India. We constantly talking about all these reversals and I really appreciate uh, uh, appreciate it that you uh, well that you brought in uh, Tanahishi Coates and the potential was it you I think it was you uh, and the potential reversal uh, uh, why don't we say uh, that the police uh, stop stop the violence um, and I think that this uh, this is of course the case also with looting um, when when the oppressor is, is using the, the the term for what uh, they are doing to describe the the oppressed so I'm thinking that um, we have been talking about a number of different forms of violence uh, that these protests are uh, kind of emphasizing and waged against. And it's not just uh, black people's deaths, obviously. And I think that language is actually one of those forms of violence uh, or discourse, if you prefer. And the way that it um, has solidified uh, into into a kind of weapon, in a sense, uh, since uh, Nixon or since the kind of uh, uh, backlash against uh, the, the civil rights. Um, so violence, but also, of course, psychological violence, uh, not, not only language, but psychological violence, which has been uh, in discussions that uh, Du Bois had these discussions with with people about slavery uh, that has been compared to other forms of indentured uh, servitude to, um, I don't know, for example, in Poland, we know that peasants were in situations where, uh, you know, lived in situations which were almost as bad as slavery. And, sh and he would say that there are a number of things that distinguished slavery uh, from those. Um, of course, uh, the fact that mainly the fact that the, the, the that a human being was owned uh, was an object, was real estate, uh, but also the fact that um, uh, the psychological work that it did convincing black people that they are lesser that they um i, I shouldn't I even go into 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 explaining it because everybody knows i'm sure that the, what i'm talking about but this the psychological uh impact uh, is, is still obviously uh visible among african americans uh to to give an example there has been a a study done uh about the infant mortality and uh, of, of black babies. And it turns out that it uh, holds still very high, even when the babies are children of well-to-do, educated, uh, smart, uh, you know, uh, well-read, uh, healthy mothers who you know care about themselves and and their uh, and their bodies when they're pregnant and still their babies are, are, are dying. Um, and it turns out that it's the level of stress of being an, a person of color in the United States. That's it. I mean, this this is it. This is this was the one thing that they shared. So these are also deaths that I think uh, people are responding to, and this this is also what the protests are are about. The fact that uh, as Franz Fanon pointed out, uh, uh, violence is brought to the home of the of the colonized by the colonizer. Uh, this is where it originates. And this is where we should locate it and analyze it.
Thank you, Christina. And it's over to Marta, uh, who, has, who, who says there are some questions and we need to be answering them soon because we need to be closing up shop soon. Yes, uh, thank you very much. We already have two questions and then one kind of partially addressed by Will. Uh, so I'll read them out and I invite those of you uh, among the participants who have some questions, please type them in into the chat. We have two questions. The first one is from Karolina Kulitska who writes, thank you very much for this panel, your important statement and making available all educational resources. I have a question about the usage of the word, quote, peaceful, unquote, in front of the protest. Should the statement be understood as support for peaceful protests only? And one more question. I always have an uneasy feeling that there seems to be some unequal dynamics of power in white people saying that black lives capitalized matter and validating them. I would love to know your thoughts. So this is uh, the first question. And then the second uh, from uh, Marta Adamos, who writes, the Minneapolis City Council members have promised to defund and dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. Do you think this is something that will actually happen? And would other cities or states adopt similar measures? So whoever wants to pick at whatever strand, um, please, uh, please go ahead. While you prepare to answer, I, I thought we could maybe combine this question about white people saying that black lives matter with a broader question, which I think is on a lot of people's minds. Uh, and that question is, what can white people do? Um, there's this famous moment in uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X, uh, where a white girl chases him up the steps of some building and asks him that question, and he says nothing. Um, I don't think that's the answer we want to hear today. Um, there, there is an enormous goodwill among um, uh, people uh, in Poland, I'm sure among our audience too. And, and that's the question to you. What do you think we can do to, to not be complicit with racism? Um, I think we've been seeing those signs everywhere, you know, where silence is complicity, silence is approval uh, and various versions of it. So. Uh, I think um, uh, Carolina's question is is um, important because you know why do we need to legitimize a movement uh, often through um, white scholarship, right, or through the academia, which is uh, we we're all in our ivory towers, but um, to do nothing is even more problematic. And I think uh, initiatives like this, or, or I think two two things, right, engage and educate, because uh, I I don't think it's adequate to just do um, Twitter politics or, or armchair activism. The time for that is over. And I know how difficult it is, especially in times of a global pandemic, but people are doing it and it's possible to do it, taking certain kinds of um, personal measures. And if you can't go out and protest, um, you can uh, get involved online. You can spread the message. You can um, educate yourselves. And I think we've already started a thread with a bunch of various documents to read, podcasts to listen to. Um, and if we have more and more fora where we can list the various resources, then we can um, uh, choose or, or uh, distribute our attention accordingly. Um, it's important to be allies and uh, not uh, sort of hijack a movement, which I don't think is necessarily happening, but it's important to uh, also, I think, let activists and, and people in the movement speak and get the recognition and the space, right? I mean, um, since we've talked a little bit about colonialism, I always think about um, Spivak's uh, Can the Subaltern Speak? The great crime of the Western academic is to always take over the space and speak for them. And I think it, it, this conversation is... Uh, not just, I mean, it is about police brutality and about racial oppression, but it's far more deep rooted in systemic racism that we've been talking about. And if I could sort of uh, draw attention to Mark Lamont Hill's book, Nobody, where he says, you know, to be nobody is to be abandoned by the states. And he talks about how um, the political class shift happens and how police departments, military, public policy, every entity, schools, criminal justice system, all partially relocate in ways often to the private sector where capitalism plays a huge role 
in the ways in which oppression happens. So um, the the stats that Josh pointed out to, you know, how many people of color have died in this country because of COVID-19 with practically no ripples. And we're still talking about stock markets and opening an economy rather than saving the lives of thousands of the population. So I think we have to think about focusing on this rather than saying, well, I don't know, this is not my lived experience, maybe I shouldn't speak. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cheyenne. The, the, this dilemma of how to be an ally without hijacking a movement, I think, is a, is a really crucial one. Um, uh, maybe Josh could speak to this very particular question about the police. I've, I've been intrigued by that as well. I'm not sure what to make of it. Sorry to interrupt you, just um, uh, an add-on. Anna Kuharska kind of has a follow-up question to that, so if you could combine this uh, in your answer. She writes, what are the requirements to become a cop in the United States? Because I have seen a lot of young Americans on social media outraged by how little, as little as six months, uh, training cops need to do their job and carry weapons. Is that true? I'm sorry for interrupting, but I think this is a, a, something you can address. Uh, both great questions. I mean, the requirements are, are very few. They're very small. I mean, in Maryland, so first of all, just remember, cities and states do things so differently in the U.S. That's part of the, the challenge here. It's very hard to implement federal change. Uh, in Baltimore, I believe the training is a six-month training to be a police officer. It's like you have to go through much longer training to uh, be allowed to cut somebody's hair. You have to go through longer training to do a number of other professions that uh, don't give the job holder the ability to kill someone. Um, so they need to be better, but the, the police department's problem right now, one of many, is that they're having declining number of, of applicants. They have fewer people who want to be police officers, so they're very hesitant to make those requirements higher. Um, the question of Minneapolis, I, I don't know. I saw that the city council voted to disband the police. I believe that the way they're interpreting that is that there have been one city in the United States, Camden, New Jersey, where they basically took apart the police force and then reconstituted it. They started a new police force that was very much focused on community policing. Can Minneapolis do that? Maybe, but it's going to take more than just the city council, I believe. I believe that the mayor will have to probably approve it. And then I imagine there will be lawsuits, just like there is with everything in the United States. It will be very interesting to see if they push through with that. Um, I think the question about what white people can do in particular is twofold. I'll just say quickly. Um, there are groups in the US, for example, showing up for racial justice, surge, S-U-R-G, and it basically departs from this idea that white people have to be holding other white people accountable, not in a, I caught you on Facebook uh, passing around this racist meme only kind of way, but that white people have to commit themselves not just to racism is bad, not just to diversity, but to anti-racism, and that they have to work in their own families, friend circles, communities um, to fight racism. I think that there's a local and global piece here, of course. Locally, one thing I would just say, all the way from Poland, believe it or not, I was thinking about this, but, you know, so Brianna Taylor, for example, killed in Louisville. They still have not brought charges against uh, her killers. Uh, I can share a link to this, but believe it or not, like people from all over the world are emailing the Attorney General of Kentucky. You can send the Attorney General of Kentucky and say, hey, uh, I'm an American Studies student. I'm in Poland. We're watching. I want to come maybe someday do a study abroad in the United States. I will never come to Louisville, Kentucky if you don't bring charges against these people. They're going to get hundreds and thousands of those kind of emails, and they matter. And it matters when you say, we're all the way across the world watching. That makes some people say, oh my God. The last thing I'll very quickly say is that uh, I think we all know, and I say this as someone who's lived in Europe three different times in, in Germany, and I've, I've been to Poland, been all over Europe, but we all know that anti-blackness is something that is a big problem in Europe. And I think um, Americans have a bad habit of saying racism is some other city or state's problem. And uh, I think it's really important that these con conversations continue in Europe. And it's very powerful to see the young woman sign about don't call me, uh, whatever the word was. 
this has a lot of implications for Europe and for Poland and for every country. How do we take anti-racism to every country and town around the world? Thank you. Uh, that discussion, I think, is really important. It is one word, but it's a word with a huge history, and there are, believe it or not, people defending it on the grounds that it's part of Polish, and who are those Americans to tell us how to use Polish words? Um, another relevant discussion that is going on um, is about uh, Fustyni w Puszcze, a, a, a novel by uh, Henryk Sienkiewicz, uh, w which is a, basically part of colonial discourse of that era and it's on uh, the obligatory reading uh, uh, list for Polish kids and there is now a petition uh, by a, a Polish teacher uh, to take it off. So I think Poland is in the in the midst of a discussion not just about what's going on in the United States but you know about our local version of racism as well. Um, uh, Krystyna, would you care to answer, to, to speak to, to either of those questions about the police brutality or um, what can white people do? And also, we have another question from Tomek Mondre about monuments, uh, the, um, uh, the the destruction or uh, despoilment of the Kościuszko monument, but also about the the overthrowing of um, Confederacy monuments uh, in in Virginia, right? Um, so, any of those? Uh, uh, well, um, I, I actually think it actually uh, goes well together with one of the first questions which I really liked um, about our use of the term peaceful and uh, whether it's only peaceful that we will back. And of course, that's again, a linguistic problem, what you define peaceful and uh, how you define peaceful and who is defining it. Uh, to me, the, the, the um, signs or the, the, you know, the quote unquote destruction of the Kościuszka monument um, is a way uh, of protesting that you know marks the space where the protests are happening and expresses uh, uh, you know a, a sentiment of, of masses of people. So to me, it's entirely legitimate. And on top of that, uh, uh, our two guests may probably will probably not know. There's this whole discussion in Poland about the fact that Kościuszko actually was anti-racist, and he did uh, dedicate some of the uh, money he he uh, uh, was owed in in the United States to uh, the anti-racist causes. So he would have been probably really really happy for uh, the scribblings on on his uh, uh, on his monument. Uh, but as people have been pointing out, it's not just Kościuszko's monument that has been written over on, uh, but other monuments as well. And uh, uh, this is a moment of uh, our kind of obsessive national pride that kind of blinds us completely to what is happening um, out there in the world. Uh, that 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 makes people, I think, obsess about about the about the about the monument. I think that the question of peaceful is something that I would love. There's probably not enough time, but I would love to discuss. Uh, it's, it, I mean, it is a, a very very di difficult question, and also a question of. Um, Compromise uh, uh, when when we uh, want it, when we work in institutional uh, contexts, which is also something uh, incredibly uh, difficult. Um, I think, and we you know none of the institutions in which we work are perfect. I'm sure for you know everybody concerned, um, and and that's uh, that is something that I found really really hard um, these days. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just for the record, the Kościuszko Foundation stepped into the Kościuszko Monument debate saying that Kościuszko would, would have been pleased um, uh, and uh, above all that uh, property is far less important than human lives and that this is something I think it was actually supported with a quote from Kościuszko. Uh, but yes, I think this is a th this moment in history is about memory. It's about public memory, not just about you know, um, economic or issues or police brutality or, or even the commemoration of lives recently lost. Um, uh, I think people are realizing finally what the legacy of slavery means for the United States and what the legacy of colonialism means for the world. So um, what's going on with monuments is, is really interesting. And I'm sure Will uh, would like to talk uh, about this because it's his big topic. 
Uh, I'm not sure it's my big topic, but certainly um, uh, I have studied Southern history, and that's sort of uh, my focus. Um, and and the whole issue of uh, Confederate monuments, they're they were built. They there there are two periods of uh, monument building. Uh, one was uh, at, at the end of the late 19th, early 20, and the beginning of the 20th century, and that was a way of raising up the monuments at a time when Jim Crow and segregation and all of these laws were going into place. The second time that uh, there was not so much monuments, but the transformation of uh, the Confederacy into something more than just um, the transformation of the memory of the Confederacy into something that was a part of uh, Southern society was in the in the 1950s during the uh, Civil Rights Movement, when the uh, Confederate battle flag was uh, the stars and bars was put onto the uh, onto that, and what what you're seeing now is an effort to reverse all of that, uh, to change the way in which these things are understood, um, and to create a way of looking at the past and understanding when these things were put up, what they meant at that time, and what they mean for us now. Uh, so that's uh, um, sort of my take on the the, the question of the uh, the monuments and and the battle flag and those kinds of things uh, should be uh, should be addressed. And quite frankly, I think uh, a lot of these uh, Confederate monuments, and you'll see them in southern towns, big towns, small towns, all across the South, um, in the town square. These monuments will be there. Um, and the question is, uh, how do you take them down? Uh, or, or how do you recontextualize that memory with other monuments, with other plaques, with other ways of describing and explaining what is going on? Okay, well, thank you, everyone. And I'm really tempted to ask everyone to turn on their mics and give us a round of applause, but I'm afraid that Google Hangouts might collapse from that. So. We managed to do a call on Hangout, great. Thank you so much. And uh, please visit our website. Please visit our Facebook uh, profile. It's becoming a place of education um, on and, and thinking about race, racial injustice and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. Thank you all very much. I wanted to thank everyone for participating in the panel. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for inviting me to this. This was this was great. I'm really happy to be a part of this. This is really wonderful.